All right, so in chapter two, we are going to begin, as the slide suggests, exploring data with tables and graphs. So the big picture in chapter one was we talked about what's the idea of statistics to study a large population by taking a sample of that population and collecting a statistic, uh, a small set of data that's part and parcel to a parameter for the overall population. And again, if I throw out some of our vocabulary words from chapter one and you're really feeling confused, feel free to just interrupt by unmuting yourself or chiming in and saying, uh, could you say that again? Or I forgot what that means. Can you explain that? So if I start to lose you, help me prevent that. But I do want to emphasize using our vocabulary because that's the only way you can get used to it and have working conversational abilities in statistics. To be able to read the problems and understand them, we have to remember what the words mean. All right, so as I was saying, we collect a statistic to make inferences and conclusions about a parameter, looking at a sample and talking about a population. And one of the ways that we extend what we see from the sample to the population is by doing statistical analysis. And we're gonna begin that in chapter two. And the simplest way to start thinking about how to do analysis on data once you've collected your data from your statistic is to talk about how to organize it, how to display it, and some simple calculations we could do like taking the average value for a set of numbers, things like that. It will of course grow more complicated, but that's where we begin. So the concept of exploring data with tables and graphs will be a way to organize the data we've collected and look at it or demonstrate it in a way that we can try to understand what the data is telling us, okay? So let's look at what the key concept is. Oh, so of course, we are looking at section one in chapter two, um, and there are um, uh, frequency distributions for organizing and summarizing data is where we will begin. That's a particular type of way to organize and demonstrate the data with a frequency distribution. Then in 2.2, um, we'll look at histograms, which is basically taking a frequency distribution and graphing it. And the, way, the reason I'm uh, pointing that out specifically is that actually I think a histogram is a nicer way to graphically illustrate a frequency distribution, and I'll demonstrate that today. Um, but I may actually show you how to make the histogram graphs today using StatCrunch after our discussion with a hope that that'll make an easier way for you to do homework problems about frequency distributions. So I'm just mentioning we may poke our nose into 2.2. But nonetheless, this is what the chapter has in store for us and we are beginning at the beginning. So key concept for 2.1, when working with large data sets, a frequency distribution or frequency table is often helpful in organizing and summarizing data. A frequency distribution helps us to understand the nature of the distribution of a data set. So what does that mean, distribution of a data set? So let's use my long running now example of wanting to understand about the heights of DVC students. So one example I've given so far is if I collected a sample of 100 students, I could look at the average of those 100 heights that I had collected. I could take those 100 height values and add them up and divide by 100 to see what the average height was. But that doesn't tell me a lot about the distribution of those heights. Maybe there were a whole lot of people that were really tall and a whole lot of people that were really short and that balanced to a value in the middle when you took the average. Or maybe most of the people were around the middle average height and very few people were very tall or very short. And how those height values were distributed from low to high in value is the idea of the distribution of a data set. So for example, why might this be important? Well, let's say I'm not too interested on what the average height is if I'm building a doorway. <clears throat> I'm interested to know if most of the students will be able to walk through that doorway without having to hunch over. And the average doesn't tell me that. 
So for example, if the average were five foot eight and I build my doorway to be five foot 10, well, if actually half of the people were six foot and the other half of the people were five foot six, and that's why we ended up with an average of five foot eight, well, then I just built a doorway. Well, half the people have to hunker down to get under it. But if instead 90% of all the people were around the average height, then I know very few people would have to stoop down to get through the doorway. So how the data is distributed is often very, very important. And so the first thing we're going to discuss is to look at and understand the distribution of a data set. All right, so having described this idea, are there any questions or comments about that? Or could you in your mind think up a type of data that was going to be collected and how the distribution of what you got would be important? And if you're willing, share that with the class, like the example that I just shared. But even if you don't want to share, think about it. Try to see if you understand this concept well enough where you could start to imagine it in the real world. Questions, comments, suggestions? So to extend, let me give you one more example since I'm not hearing any, but I hope you're struggling and trying to figure this out because that's how you're gonna learn and grow. One of the simple ways that this is obvious important in lots of circumstances is when you are trying to build something to accommodate a large group and you wanna make sure that the dimensions of what you're creating will accommodate most of the group. And I talked about people walking under a doorway. Let's say you're going to build a pet container uh, in the internal hold of an airplane for when people are bringing pets along and they, they wanna put them in the pet compartment. Well, then you might want to get some sense of how big a container is needed to service or satisfy that need for the bulk of the types of pets that would be brought on. And so you might want to do some sort of a survey or study, maybe even from your um, customers to get a sense of when they're bringing pets on, what kind of distribution of sizes there are and how big you would need to make the container to perhaps make sure that it would be large enough to satisfy 90% or more of your customers. And so you would need to know not the average size, but you would need to know the distribution of sizes so that you know when you've reached the point where there aren't that many that are larger than the size that you're ready to accommodate. Questions about that? Thoughts, comments? All right, so if you can try to stay engaged and try to follow along even if just with your imagination so that these concepts make sense and then you can have discussions about them and understand what we're doing. All right, so let's see, what are we gonna do? Frequency distribution, let's define this. A frequency distribution or frequency table shows how data are partitioned among several categories or classes by listing the categories along with the number or the frequency of the data values in each of them. So this is pretty succinct definition, but instead of trying to memorize that, the best way to understand what they're describing is with examples. So let's, I'm gonna move on quickly from here. So in this discussion, they said there are these classes. So the lower class limits is the smallest number that can belong to each of the different classes. The upper class limits is the largest number that can belong to each of the classes. And the class boundaries are the numbers used to separate the classes, but without the gaps created by class limits. So all of that is most likely meaningless unless you know what the heck we're talking about. And again, that's best demonstrated with examples. So in this case, the best thing is to look at an example of a frequency distribution and then go back to these definitions and try to match them up with the one that's being shown. So let's see if we can do that. Same thing with class midpoints, class width. I'm going to keep moving on until we get to an example. 
So then they describe a process for conducting, constructing a frequency distribution. It's probably good to read through this and try to understand it. However, I think in our case, we are going to want to most of the time try to allow technology to help us construct these. Uh, but it is good to understand how it was constructed and therefore what it is showing us. But again, I'm, I'm gonna skip over the weeds here a little bit because I think examples are what best illustrates all of these things they're talking about. So let's look at this first example. And we are already looking at this on this slide at a frequency distribution or a frequency table. And there, uh, again, this is slide number one out of five, as we can see on the top of the slide. So there's gonna be five slides discussing this one example. And then, then they'll go through all those definitions they just gave us and show them how they applied so that we can understand what they mean and what they were trying to get at. So it says, using the McDonald's lunch service times in the first table. So there's a table on top there that has two rows of data. And let me count here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So I'm thinking there's like 34 values in those first two rows, 17 times two. So it says using the lunch service times in the first table, follow the procedure shown on the next slide to construct the frequency distribution shown in the second table. Use five classes. So there, the second box they're showing us is the result that they're asking for. The second box is an example of a frequency distribution table. And the first box is the data they use to create that. So now let's discuss some of those definitions a little bit as they go through on the slides. I will just highlight a couple of things, but then the, coming, the following slides will sort of walk us through this a little bit. So on the left, under where it says time, and it has in parentheses seconds, there are ranges of values, 75-124, 125-174, 125-175, 125 those are the classes. So each of those is a class, and then it said use five classes in the end of the paragraph, and as you can see, there's five of those ranges of values there. The frequency in the column to the right of the class column is the number of how many of the data values fell within the given range. So if you go through and look through those values, oh wait, they have 35, they have 50. Did I do my math super wrong? How did they get to 50? They're showing a frequency of 50, but I didn't count 50. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So I'm definitely only seeing 34 values of numbers. So I'm wondering, there, that means some data is missing. It might be when they condensed onto this slide that they lost some of the data. That might not be a comprehensive list. You might have to go to the textbook to see the complete list of data. And there, all the data sets used by the book uh, are given in an appendix of data values that you can also access and dump right into StatCrunch. So maybe we'll look at that a little bit later. Um, but yeah, I just want to point this out because it might be confusing if you think that's all the data there. When if I add up the frequency values, I get a total of 50 different number, different frequencies here, but I don't see 50 values of data. So I think some of the data must be missing from this slide. Nonetheless, if you looked at the full data set, which I'm thinking we're not able to do on this slide, then you, then you should find that 11 of the values were between 75 and 124 inclusive. All right, so let's look at as they walk us through the construction of this. And again, at any time, if you wanna ask a question, please feel free to interrupt to do so. Because I wanna make sure that as we're moving forward, I'm not gradually leaving more and more people behind. I don't wanna do that. So having said that, so they're, they're going through the process of how they're saying they created that table. Step one, five was the number of desired classes because that's what they told us. Calculate the class width as shown below. Note that we round up, which is a more convenient number. So this will feel a little arbitrary 
And I do want to emphasize not to get too lost in the weeds of this process like a formula, because really you're going to pretty much always do this in StackCrunch. That's my recommendation. Chapter two is where we're going to begin to use StackCrunch. And I'd rather, I want to illustrate some of that use today. And then I'll also take us and remind us that I've shot videos about how to do some things in StackCrunch to, to access along the way as well. So nonetheless, they basically took the range of values from smallest to biggest and divided that range into five so they'd know how big each class width would be. And they're showing that process here. So the smallest value was 83, the biggest value was 308, the difference between those divided by five was 45. Then they very roughly to the very first digit rounded that up to 50 and said, all right, we'll just make all of our classes have a width of 50. And that way we know we're gonna cover all the values in the range. Okay. So then they said, all right, where should our lower class begin? And they ended up going a little bit below the lowest value. And then they were able with class widths of 50 to get above the highest value. And that assured them that the range of values in their classes would cover all of the data values collected. And then they basically added those up in each. So first they got the lower value of each of their classes. And then the upper value as described here would be one less than the minimum value of the next class up. Again, I know I'm going quickly. I don't wanna to go too much in the weeds here for something you're really not really gonna do by hand much ever. And then they ended up with this frequency distribution table. So again, it was a little rushed and I'm, I'm, I'm pointing that out because they were focusing on the process here and we won't use the process really much at all. But instead, I would like us to make sure we've had a chance to discuss the idea of what a frequency distribution table is and what it's telling us. Questions, comments, discussions? Um, so just to clarify, actually, they so it seems like with this process, they weren't actually missing any values. They just needed to round around the values to make things more convenient to make these classes. That's what it seems like. Um, so when you say missing values, uh, you were mentioning because there were there were fifty, um, right? There's fifty, but they only had uh, thirty four. Yes. Actual data set. So they're not actually missing more of those. They're just rounding around those. Well, they they I'm saying they're missing them in that they didn't show them to us. They're okay. not missing them. We're missing them. Okay. <laughs> because and and the rounding had nothing to do with that. Um, so when they got once they created their classes, which they have here. How did they determine how many of the data values are each in each of those range values? Well, it says enter a tally mark for each data value in the appropriate class, then add the tally marks to find the frequency shown in the table. Basically go over the data set and, and every time you come across one in the first range, make note of that and add those up. Well, we wouldn't be able to do that with the data they showed us because not all the 50 data values are there. Okay, that, gotcha. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, so they have access to it and we do too if we go find the full data set. I bet the full data set is given in the book. I mean, to be honest, these slides are never gonna be perfect. I don't even know who created them. The publisher pays probably some grad students or something like that to create some slides to illustrate what's in the textbook and there are potentially mistakes or things done that the teacher needs to clarify. So what I wanted to make sure that if people are sitting here trying to see how this frequency distribution was generated from that table, well, if you're trying to learn what these are, you're gonna have problems because the bunch of the data is missing. And, uh, and that's just never pointed out here. So I, that's my, part of my job. Is that making sense at all? Yeah, thank you. All right, so let's uh, move forward. So one of the ways you can add to or modify a frequency distribution is to create a relative frequency distribution. And again, you can use tools to do this for you and they're gonna talk about how they did it. And I wanna focus a little bit more on what it is so that when you're looking at one, you know what it's telling you and less about how to make one. Even though 
thinking about how to make it does help illustrate what it is. So I don't want to totally say that that's of no value. I just don't want you to think that you're going to be spending a lot of time making these because you're not. <laughs> um, so a relative frequency distribution is where instead of saying how many of the data values are in a particular class, you say what percent of all the data values is in that particular class. So for example, if I were to tell you that 11 of the McDonald's waiting times was in the first class, and that's all you knew, well, that's not really a good way to know how much of the McDonald's folks had to wait in the in the class range in the first time in that first class range. Because if you say there's 11 okay 11 people waited that amount of time, but was that 11 out of a million or 11 out of 12. I mean, we really don't know the distribution if we don't know how much that number is out of the entire group of the data. Whereas a percentage would tell us that. In fact, if you know a percentage, you might even say that the, the number of frequency value itself is irrelevant. So if instead I told you that 10% of the folks waited the time in that first range, 20% of the folks had to wait the time in the second range, that could have a lot more meaning to get an idea of when people are waiting at McDonald's, how likely it is you're gonna to have to wait a short amount of time versus a longer amount of time. And so when you give percentages in each class instead of actual frequencies, that's called a relative frequency because you're giving the, the, the relative amount of data in that class, not the actual value itself. So relative frequency distribution or percentage frequency distribution, each class frequency is replaced by a relative frequency or proportion or a percentage. So if we see here, the sum of the percentages is a relative frequency distribution must be very close to 100. That's because if you have every class cover all the range of values, and you say what percent of data is in each range, then those percentages should add up close to 100 with rounding with the idea that you've covered all the data in there. A cumulative frequency is where instead of specifically saying how many are in a particular range, you allow the numbers to get bigger and bigger in each of your what would have been classes, and then always say how much of the data value was at that number or below. And that way it's like climbing a ladder to get to the sort of the biggest value or something that's larger than the biggest value in which at that point you've just demonstrated all the data. But you can imagine how many of the data values are included if you go up and up and up and up. So for example, why is this a way to organize the data? Well, for example, if I get to, if I use my doorway example for making a doorway for students, well, then I might wanna say, how high do I need to get to make sure that 95% of the people can walk under there without having to bend over? Well, if as I'm showing higher and higher heights of my possible doorways and the percentage of people is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, then I can focus on when I hit 95% and that's as high as I need for my doorway. Or let's say McDonald's isn't really interested when they do their study in how many people waited two minutes versus three minutes. They just want to make sure that the vast majority of their customers wait less than five minutes. And so in this case, that would be people who were less than 300 seconds. And so they might just say, let's do a cumulative frequency and see when we really hit the point where we've got enough of our, our folks waiting less than five minutes to feel that we've done a good job. Questions, comments, discussions about these types of ways of organizing data? So if you are accumulating the values as you increase in your classes and not just say how many were in that specific range, that's called a cumulative frequency distribution because you're accumulating your values as you go up the class range. So after giving you this big pile of definitions and describing things that you're not used to, 
they say, yeah, we should use uh, critical thinking. <laughs> it's very hard to critically think about something until you understand comfortably what it is you're talking about. And so it does take some time to warm up to what these things are and what they're showing you. And again, the best way to do that is to see a lot of them. And the best way to do that is to let technology create them for you so that you don't feel that the whole setting it up process is this big burden. <coughs> Excuse me. Using frequency distributions to understand data. In statistics, we are often interested in determining whether the data have a normal distribution. This is going to be extremely important concept for the entirety of our semester. A normal distribution will be very important. And this is the first time we've used that phrase. So that's why I'm drawing extra attention to it. But take note of it whenever you see that, because most of statistics is working on an idea of a normal distribution. So what is it about a normal distribution? The frequencies start low, then increase to one or two high frequencies, then decrease to low frequency. So imagine that you have your little table and you have at the top of the table, lower numbers of, of data values in that class. Then when you get to the middle of the table, then you have higher frequency values. And then when you go to the, the other end of the higher values in the class, it falls back down to a lower frequency. The, the way to summarize this visually in your mind in a way that you might have heard of is this is typically referred to as a bell curve. If you've ever heard that phrase, the idea is you imagine something in the shape of a bell. And that's why using histograms to graph these is going to be very important. And I'll do that today, even though it doesn't really show up as a topic until 2.2 is that if you imagine the frequencies graphed up and down on a system, then the smaller values on the left would be low on the graph. Then as you went to the middle values, the graph would climb up. And then as you went to the higher values, the graph would climb back down. And that creates this bell-shaped curve. That's the visual impression you wanna have for a normal distribution. And that's what they're trying to kind of describe here. The distribution is approximately symmetric. Frequencies preceding the maximum frequency should be roughly a mirror image to those that follow the, um, follow the maximum frequency. So meaning the peak frequency, it kind of tapers off symmetrically on each side as you go higher or lower in your class range. And that's why you get this sort of symmetrical bell shape. Questions, comments, discussions so far? So there are uh, some smaller details to think about, and I'm gonna go through them more quickly because I wanna save a chunk of time today to go over and look at and introduce the idea of using StatCrunch. The presence of gaps can show the data are from two or more different populations. However, the converse is not true because data from different populations do not necessarily result in gaps. So what are they talking about? Well, they're, they're beginning to try to talk about how you could look at the results of a frequency distribution table and start to think about what that's saying about the populations that you've collected the data from. And I think they have an example which may be okay to look at. So this is an example of exploring data. And after this example, I will head away to um, from the slides and give us a chance to look at what problems like and how to make frequency distributions using technology. So this is uh, two slides about what does a gap tell us. The table shown is a frequency distribution of the weights in grams of randomly selected pennies. So notice on the left are these things we called classes where you give a, a range of values that the weight might fall into. And they're pretty small little ranges because pennies are made fairly the same, but there's some variance in how they're made. And um, each of the classes starts at a lowest value of 2.4 grams and finishes at the end with almost 3.2 grams. And if you look at the table, what you'll see is that a chunk of the pennies were all in this very lower range but then there was nothing in the middle and then a big chunk 
was up around three grams. A bunch were around two and a half grams and then nothing in the middle and then a bunch around three grams. So what does that tell us about pennies? Well, for some reason, pennies are falling into these two different groups. We don't necessarily know what that reason would be, but we can see from the data that that's what's going on. That tells us something about the population of the weights of pennies. It tells us something about that parameter when we look at this statistic and look at it organized this way. Questions, comments, discussion about this? So the real thing that this example is trying to help you do is to put yourself in a position where you would literally try to look at a frequency distribution table and see what it tells you. So initially you're just like, I don't know what this is. And they've got this big long list of steps and procedures I'm supposed to do to make one. But as I've been trying to say, making it is not what's important. Understanding what it's showing you is what's important. And this is a slide to try to have you begin to just put yourself in that position for the first time with no expectations of being good at it or anything like that, or having all of this insight, but just saying, what do I see here? When I look at how the values of the data are distributed over this range of possible answers, what am I seeing? This is an example of trying to think like that. So let's see what they have to say about it. Examination of the frequencies reveals a large gap between the lightest and the heaviest pennies. This suggests that we have two different populations. And now they're explaining why there's a gap and why this makes sense. Pennies made before 1983 are 95% copper and 5% zinc. And pennies made after 1983 are 2.5% copper and 97.5% zinc. So basically after 1983, the government took out a bunch of the copper out of pennies and put in a different kind of metal. And that meant that the pennies they made after that were on average a different weight than those made before. Does that make sense? Now there's no reason to expect that just by looking at the fact that there were these two different groups of weights of pennies, that we would have any idea what the explanation for that would be, but they're providing one just for us to try to make sense of what we were able to gleam a little bit of by looking at the distribution of the data. Questions, comments, discussions about this example? All right, we're almost to the end of this slide set. We're looking at number 20 out of 23. So we did sort of at least quickly go over, and again, all of these slides are available to everyone in the multimedia library. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and stop the slideshow at this point so that we can try to think about how to easily access and look at visually um, visual versions of tables as well as graphs of distribution tables. Any questions before I leave the slides behind? Any slide you want us to look at again or something for me to clarify before I uh, walk away from them? Anything at all? And we got about what, 20 minutes, okay. Okay, so let's do that. So the way I'm going to move this forward, if I can do it here, is to uh, just go ahead and start looking at a homework problem. And I had one ready, but it seems to have gone away, I think. All right, so let's see, like maybe this one. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look and I'm gonna keep recording while I do this because this is probably just as important as the other part that we did. Okay, so why is it not showing that problem? All right, one more try. Uh, let's just do this. <clears throat> 
So I'm now believe if you hopefully you can see this is a problem number four. So as we can also see on the left here, this is from chapter two, section one. So when you're working on your assignments, if you're confused by something, you can at least on the upper left corner, see which section that came from, if you wanna go back to the section in some way. And so it says, does the frequency distribution appear to have a normal distribution using a strict interpretation of the relevant criteria, meaning what they described about being a normal distribution. And so we're supposed to look at this and basically see if sort of what I described visually is that it has a bell shaped curve in how the frequencies are distributed, meaning lower on the ends, high in the middle with some basic symmetry. So looking at this distribution in this table here, what do you guys think? Questions, comments, discussions, opinions? It definitely peaks in the middle and has uh, pretty much symmetrical lower values. So what do you guys think? Does that sound reasonable? Anyone have a different opinion or want to chime in with agreement? Hmm, can't seem to pull up my chat. So if you're chatting away, I apologize if I can't read it. All right, so let's test, put that answer to the test. So does that mean we wanna say yes, all the requirements are met? Sounds like it. They say no, so why not? So let's look at what, what they did. Now notice when you do mark get one marked wrong, it gives you a hint. It says the distribution might be normal by loose interpretation of the relevant criteria, but one of the two requirements is not satisfied by the strict interpretation. And we can ask for a similar question so that we can think about this again. So I will point out correctly uh, that the commenter said that it does seem to peak in the middle. That was one of the requirements. So what do we think is the other requirement they're talking about that was not met? And notice in our two no choices, they sort of say, no, it does not appear to be normal. No, the frequencies do not decrease from the maximum frequency to a low frequency. So we're even not, not only can we just say no, we're sort of, sort of supposed to pick between the two. What do you guys think? So because zero is actually the lowest, it never decreases back down to there. So is that? I mean. Yeah, it seems like it went down, but then it went back up. And notice it does that on one side, but not on the other side. And that also messes with the thing that it mentioned about um, being sort of symmetric. So there's kind of a higher point in the middle, but there's a, like, if I look at how many above 12, there's 12 above 12, but only six below it. So that also means that there isn't that symmetry of a bell shape. There's a lump, but the lump is kind of skewed a little bit, or it goes up to a lump and then kind of doesn't go down evenly on both sides. So symmetry is another very important aspect of that kind of distribution. So would we say the frequencies do not decrease from the maximum frequency to a low frequency? Would we say, no, it does not appear to be normal, maybe because of the symmetry? And I'm going to just right off the bat suggest that people think that there's a little bit of trial and error in these. Remember, anytime you get a problem wrong, even if you have to get it on the first try, even whenever you get a problem wrong, you can do a similar version and then do it again. And I want to point that out, not so much because I'm encouraging students to game the system where they just keep guessing until they get it and move on, but I don't want you to get too discouraged if you're feeling confused and, and worrying that that's gonna hurt your ability to get points. Definitely you should look to be trying to understand these as well as you can, but that takes time and I don't want you to get too frustrated early on. Notice that there's help options and there's an ability to repeat the problem until you get it right and there's hints. And so working with all of that, I would hope you would feel that it's not going to be impossible or overwhelming for you to get a good score on these assignments and that your focus instead should be on trying to understand what's going on. Let's move on to another one as time is short. Well, not too short. We're doing good. 
So this is where I'd like to illustrate how technology can help you. So it says the data represents the body mass index values for 20 females. Construct a frequency distribution beginning with a lower class limit of 15 and use a class width of six. And then it wants you to fill in the frequencies. Now it's already done a bunch of the construction for you because they've created and mapped out the classes for you here. And you, th you can think about how with what they said, this is how the classes should come out. Did they start where the lower class limit should begin? Did they use a class width of six? That goes back to those definitions of what a class is, what a class width is, lower class limits, things like that. So by looking at tables, these words hopefully will start to make more sense to everybody. So what would we still have to do or what remains, what does it, what remains for us to do in order to complete this? We would just need to figure out the frequencies. So can anyone suggest how I might do this problem just looking at it by ourselves, what we would do to do the problem? You might just like tally it, like how many of those numbers fall in between each class and that's the frequency for that class? Exactly. So literally would say, all right, I'm gonna look through these 20 numbers and as I go, I'm gonna make a mark or, or make a count going of how many were between 15 and 20.9 or less than 21. And then when I see how many there were when I've gone through the set, then that would be the frequency of those data values that were in this set. And this is a good way to start because then you really know what you're looking for. You get an idea of what that frequency means by literally counting up the data values. But at the same time, I can point out, well, what if instead of 20 of them, there were 200 of them? Would you really wanna scan through the 200 five different times to do these tallies and count up along the way? Especially note that the data values aren't in any particular order, right? If they were already ordered from lowest to biggest, well, then you could just count how many were on the bottom until you got to this number. That would certainly be a lot faster, but now they're just all randomly spread around in there. And so here's, that's where technology can help us a lot. So the first thing I'm gonna remind us is that I've been suggesting that what we want to use to assist us in the technological analysis of data is a program called StatCrunch. And I shot a videos introducing you to the program, how to access it, things like that. And so I'm not gonna try to cover all that here because we have seven minutes left and I have a whole video, but I'm gonna demonstrate what it looks like when you begin to work with StatCrunch. When they give you this box of data here, notice that there's a little icon in the upper left and if I hover over it, it says click to copy the table. And if I click on that, one of, the very first option is to open in StatCrunch. You can also just copy it to a clipboard if you then want to paste in some other program, or you can open it directly in Excel because Excel is the number one data management program on the planet. However, I'm recommending StatCrunch because it's free and it's included and it's the most user friendly of all the options we have. So if I open this in StatCrunch, let's see what that looks like. So notice it has the Pearson logo here and it says StatCrunch, and this is now the program StatCrunch, which is actually supplied by another company and another website. And what you'll see is that all the data values in this problem have now been dumped into the first column of StatCrunch for us, and we don't have to copy them over. You don't have to type them. They're in StatCrunch and ready to be analyzed in some way or another. Now, I'm also going to point out, since this is our first look at this, that there are these tabs along the top to help us begin to think about what we're going to do with the data. And there's lots of stuff under each tab. But happily, Basically, everything we're going to do in this class is only under two of these tabs, stat and graph, stat and graph. The entire of the semester, our work in StatCrunch will fall under one of these two. There's still lots of stuff there, but you can ignore basically all the rest of that. Now, one of the things you can do in an, uh, a spreadsheet program like this, you could also, instead of Excel, use Google Sheets. That's a free program that will have all those same capabilities. 
But one of the examples of what you can do is when you have the data in a column, as I mentioned before, it might be nice if these were organized in order because then it would be easy to count up how many were in each class. So one of the things I could use StatCrunch to do would be to just organize the data to make it easy to do the tally. So if you go to a column where there's data and you highlight over the down arrow and you click on that, then it gives you some choices about how to sort the data as well as other things. You can delete the column, move the column, but down here, sort table in ascending order or in descending order. Ascending is from smallest to biggest, descending is from biggest to smallest. So if I click on sort table ascending, then now all the data has been written down from smallest to biggest. Now, if I wanted to know how many are go up to 20.9, I could just find 20.9 on the where that would fall on my list. And I can see that's between items three and four. And that means the first three were below 20.9. And I can go in here and I can type in a three. So it would make it a lot easier for me just to organize these from smallest to biggest to do my tally. Questions, comments about that first thing I've shown to do or how to get the data in StatCrunch? All right, so that would make the job of me making a tally myself easier. However, what if we don't even have to do that? <laughs> so the other thing I'm gonna show you is I can go over to stat and one of the options is tables. And then there's this thing for frequency tables. Sometimes this is exactly what we want. So let's take a look at it. I think actually a histogram will be better for this problem, but let's go ahead and take a look together. So then now that I've told it I want to make a frequency table, it's going to say, all right, well, which column do you want to use? Because even though we only have one column because there was one set of data, often big data sets might have columns of different types of data that were collected. And this way you can make a table out of which column you want but I would pick the only column that's available by selecting it. Now notice we looked earlier that there was this thing called the frequency table and then they defined a relative frequency table. Well, notice those are options, frequency, relative frequency, right down there is cumulative frequency. That was one of the other things they showed us. So let's say I just click on frequency. And then there's, um, order by ascending, descending, worksheet, count ascending. There's things you can explore. Sometimes you're just trying to wanna, gonna wanna try to learn the minimum of what you need to do in StatCrunch to get what you want. What if I just hit compute? Let's just see what we would get. Well, in this case, they just listed every value in the table because there wasn't that many. And but they did list them for smallest to biggest like we had here. So here we could tally things up and this is a frequency distribution table, but because there was only 19 values even at all, they just listed them all separately. Maybe that's not ideally what we would want here. And you could try to modify the table to get the class structure they wanted. But I just want to show you how you could quickly make a table. And if you had a whole lot of values, they would have then offered you options about putting them into classes. But my recommendation in this case is even better thing is to have already looked a little bit about how to make a histogram, which doesn't technically come up until 2.2, but let me show it to you because it's easier way to do this problem. A histogram is a kind of graph. So if I go to the graph tab, a histogram is here. And again, it's going to say, which column of data do you want to make for this graph? And I'm going to select it. What type? Frequency. But now they have these things they call bins. Those are classes. The stat crunch name for classes is bins. And the problem said you want to start at 15 and have a width of six. So I put in here that I want to start at 15 and make a width of six. And then I say, OK, compute, and it's going to make a graph. And what you'll see is that each of those classes are illustrated with a graph, but if I hover over the class, it will show me what the frequency was and the range of values. And what you can see is that the range of values is from 15 up to 21, not including 21. That was our first class, and there are three things in it. It's already done the tallying for us, and it gave us a graphical presentation for that. 
then I can say, all right, well, that means the next one had uh, looks like eight and then six and then two and then one. So I can go over here and I can go eight, six, two, one. Whoops, I think I did 62 instead of six and two. Six, ah, do have to type it in correctly. Six, two, one. So there's some work to start to warm up to the idea of what you can do in StatCrunch.